Is nuclear power a sustainable or safe solution to ongoing energy demands around the world? Fairwind's Arnie Gunderson was invited to speak in August at the WAVE Conference, sponsored by Life Chiropractic College West. More than 1,600 chiropractors attended the conference near San Francisco, California, to hear speakers like Arnie Gunderson and Aaron Brockovich talk about speaking truth to power. Arnie spoke about the four problems that will be created worldwide by building more nuclear plants. As you will see in this video, Arnie is using the iPad app Keynote for his TED-like presentation. So our next speaker uh, gave me this DVD, and because uh, I know he wasn't going to talk about it, he's been 40 years in nuclear science, and he has a very, very powerful message. And if we're going to talk about visionaries, of talking about world and uh, just a global perspective, you're about to hear a very, very powerful segment. What he did was he put up all these free YouTubes, uh, hundreds of them, and he took the best 12 clips and he put it together on a DVD for us just to be educated so we can educate our uh, patients just on what's going on on a radiation level and how it is affecting the health of humankind. And so he's giving these away at his booth afterwards, signing copies of it, and is just asking for a tax-free donation. He's not selling them, but he is asking for a donation. And I think if we're going to be able to sow and spread the mesh of vitality throughout this world, it's no problem to donate to a great cause. So I want to bring this gentleman up, Mr. Gunderson, to share with us. Give a round of applause and stand to our feet and bring the energy. Thank you very much for, ha for having me, and um, welcome from the state of Vermont, the state with the first GMO labeling law. We're excited about that. A <clears throat> uh, quick shout out, I, I have to thank these, the audio video visual guys. They've been breathtakingly phenomenal for this whole thing. So, <clears throat> uh, Today, I'd like to uh, talk to you about my observations from the, the data that's come out of the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Basically, radiation knows no borders. But there'll be four topics I'd like to cover real quickly. The first is that, that accidents happen frequently. Nuclear accidents happen frequently. The second is that the accidents are um, getting worse with time, not better. The third is as bad as Fukushima Daiichi really was and continues to be, it could have been much worse. And finally, radiation knows no borders. Well, the guy on the screen here has uh, there's 42 years of difference between the guy on the screen and the guy on the stage here, and a lot of gray hair. You know the the um, but the real difference is uh, when I got out of school, I was you know a lot of intellect and no wisdom. And I think over those 42 years, uh, I've gained a lot of wisdom and perhaps lost a little intellect. But, but um, uh, So I come to you not as an expert in nuclear power, but I think as a veteran in nuclear power. And I've seen uh, near misses, and I've seen five major accidents in my, in my career. The first accident was TMI, and, and the younger people here think TMI is you know, too much information. Uh, <laughs> But it, there was an accident called TMI, Three Mile Island, uh, in Pennsylvania. And that was 35 years ago. Then in the 80s, there was a, uh, a catastrophic accident at Chernobyl. And then we went 23 years without any nuclear accidents. And there was a hubris that set in. And people believed that, that um, we had it licked. We understood how to control the atom. And then came Fukushima Daiichi Unit 1. Fukushima Daiichi Unit 2, and Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. So the, the first lesson, and the, and the shortest I might add, is that accidents are going to happen frequently. In 35 years, we've had, we've had um, five of them. 35 divided by five is seven. Once every seven years, on average, we'll have a nuclear accident. The other, the other lesson, though, is that the nuclear industry is talking to our policymakers, and they're saying the chance of an accident is one in a million. Well, if you take a million per, per reactor year, 
and you divide by the 400 reactors that are in the world right now, you wind up with million divided by 400 is 2,500 years. One accident every 2,500 years. So our policymakers are making decisions based on essentially an accident can never happen, but history has shown us that on average, once every seven years, we're going to have a nuclear accident. So Einstein had it right, and everybody's quoting Einstein this, this weekend. That's kind of interesting. Um, he basically said that if, if, as a society, we're going to make a decision on um, building nuclear power plants, that decision has to be made in the town greens, in the town meeting halls, and work its way up. And what we're having here, and especially in Japan and in, and in Asia, is a top-down policy on, on the implementation of nuclear power. We need to expect once a decade there's going to be a bad nuclear accident. This is uh, Three Mile Island's nuclear core. It's a robot picture taken about two years after the nuclear accident. TMI was a partial nuclear meltdown. The nuclear core was destroyed, it melted down, but it was contained in the nuclear reactor. Lots of radioactive gases were released and people did die. This is Steve Wing. Dr. Steve Wing is an epidemiologist at University of North Carolina. And he put together this map. You see a white line from the upper left to the lower right. That's the Susquehanna River. And where the Three Mile Island was, and along the river on either side are red, then further away is green. Well, what does that mean? On the day of the accident, there was no air moving, there was no wind. So the radioactive gases laid in the river valley. And Dr. Wing's epidemiology clearly shows that people did die along the river valley compared to the people on the surrounding hills. Well, then came Three Mile Island, I'm sorry, then came Chernobyl. And uh, this is a picture of the nuclear core, what's left of it, at Chernobyl. It's called the elephant's foot. It's about 100 tons of molten nuclear material. Um, a robot got in there and took that picture about a year after the nuclear accident. It was so highly radioactive that no one's gone near that ever since. Well, obviously, I think we all know that Chernobyl did release radiation. There's a map of Europe. And it shows that the, um, basically the Ukraine was highly contaminated, but it didn't stop at the border. You know, the radiation didn't say, whoa, this accident happened in Ukraine, I'm not gonna cross that line. It was first detected up in Sweden, and then later it, was, it showed up in, in England. Even today, cattle in Wales cannot be eaten because they're contaminated. Even today, wild boar that hunters catch in Germany can't be eaten because they're radiologically contaminated. Even today, the Laps in Lapland can't eat reindeer because they're contaminated. Well, where is the core at Fukushima? No one knows. Fukushima is so radioactive and there's so much destruction that we don't have a picture of the core at, at, at Fukushima. So it's left to the imagination where those three nuclear cores might be. But we do know that unlike Chernobyl and unlike Three Mile Island, they're in direct contact with groundwater. I'll show you a couple pictures of radiation releases from, um, uh, from Chernobyl though. The first one is a, a time lapse. This whole event happened in, in two seconds. It'll take me maybe 15 seconds to get through it. But this is um, Fukushima Daiichi 2, 3, and 4. Those white boxes from left to right are 2, 3, and 4. And uh, Unit 1 had already blown up. It's a little bit to the, to the uh, left on the scale. I want you to keep your eye on the white box in the middle. Okay, right there, that flash, is something that the day before Fukushima actually happened, no one believed that that flash was possible. It's called a detonation shockwave. And it destroyed the building in a period of two seconds. OK. 
kind of looks like a face. That whole event happened in two seconds. It was one of six explosions at Fukushima Daiichi and released an enormous amount of radiation. But it wasn't just these explosions that released the radiation. It was the chronic and long-lasting radi radioactive releases that um, are contaminating Japan even till today. I have two geeky pictures to show you. This is an infrared picture looking down on Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. The big white spot in the middle is the boiling nuclear fuel pool. Um, but what's more important, just to the right of that is a little tiny white spot, and it's labeled 128C. That's 128 centigrade, or 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you remember your high school physics, water boils at 212. That's not steam being released from the containment at Fukushima Daiichi. That's hot radioactive gases. Next picture is a piece of dust. It was found in Nagoya, which is 300 miles away from, from the accident. Uh, what makes this piece of dust unique is that it's highly radioactive. If instead of a, a, a fleck of dust, I had a pound of it in, the, in my hand, the front rows would be dead in about a minute or two, and the back would probably be dead in about 20 minutes. That's hot nuclear fuel that wound up 300 miles away in Nagoya. We call that a hot particle. We saw them in Japan, but also in Seattle. These are air filters from cars in Japan. The, the, the lab, Fairwinds in the lab that we work with asked for people to send us their air filters. On the far right is an air filter from Fukushima City, about 20 miles away. And those black spots are spots where radiation has actually burned the photographic film. A car engine breathes about the same amount of air in the course of a day as a human lung. So imagine what's in the lungs of the people in Fukushima City. The middle one is Tokyo, again, highly contaminated with hot particles. And the lab we work with uh, at Fairwind set up a, a filter in Seattle. And um, we can pretty clearly show that from the end of March all the way through April of 2011, the average person in Seattle breathed in about 10 hot particles a day. And if you were an athlete and you were out running, it might be as high as 20 hot particles a day. This is the saddest picture in the bunch. We asked for people to send us sneakers, kids' sneakers. And the, the, the bars on the left are, are sneakers from Japan. The bars on the right are sneakers from the US. The minimum level of detection is 10, so the sneakers from the US are clean. Kids were in those sneakers, and kids tie their shoes and put their hands in their mouth, so the kids are contaminated. Now, this is just the airborne radiation that's continuing to come out of Fukushima. Then there's the ocean. Unlike Chernobyl and unlike TMI, Fukushima continues to bleed into the ocean because those nuclear cores have melted down and are in direct contact with the groundwater. It will bleed for centuries, perhaps, and certainly decades to come. So when you compare these nuclear accidents, we have to say, how to, TMI was, was uh, a partial meltdown, all contained. Then came um, uh, Chernobyl, full meltdown, but didn't hit the groundwater. And then came uh, Fukushima with, with its uh, contamination in the ocean. Well, now, you're, you're health professionals. What does this mean to health professionals? How, what's the impact of this radiation? And th this is my favorite comic of all time. It's, it's a Dilbert. The pointy-headed boss asks for an analysis. Dilbert says, I can do this feasibility analysis in two minutes. And Dilbert then says, it's the worst idea in the, in the world. Numbers don't lie. And the boss says, but our CEO loves the idea. And Dilbert says, luckily, assumptions do lie. And the bottom line here is that if you talk to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about Three Mile Island, on their website they say no one died. And Dr. Wing's analysis clearly shows that lots did. If you talk to the International Atomic Energy Agency about, about Chernobyl, they'll say that 28 people to 100 uh, died. But Dr. Alexei Yablokov, who was the science advisor to Boris Yeltsin, 
when the Soviet, when the when Russia was created, has written a book with dozens of collaborators, showing a million people did. Big disparity here. The day that Fukushima was melting down, nuclear experts said working in a nuclear plant is safer than working in Toys R Us. That's a, that's a direct quote. And yet there's experts out there like me, independent experts, who are saying that as many as a million cancers may result from, from, um, from that accident. So it, it, it reminds me, and I think there's uh, one of the, uh, there's some simpatico here with my audience, I hope. When, when I speak truth to power at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they don't want to hear it. And it reminds me very much about what chiropractors go through when they talk to the AMA. You know, you're, you're dealing with an orthodoxy that really doesn't want to hear the facts. And that's what independent experts like me face pretty much on a daily basis when we talk to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So the, um, the bottom line is that accidents are getting worse. The severity of accidents is getting worse, not less worse. Okay, nuclear power's big advantage is also its critical flaw. This is a fission, and you see that bright spot in the middle. Everybody knows that when you split a uranium atom up, it gives off a lot of heat. If that's all that happened, it would be okay. But what they don't tell you in that picture and what they don't tell you in the high school text are the radioactive rubble that's left behind. Those two pieces, we call them fission products, remain physically hot and radioactively hot. Physically hot for five years, radioactively hot for thousands. Well, what that means is that when a nuclear reactor shuts down, it's really not shut down. It has to be cooled for five years. This is a satellite picture looking down on the intake structures that were on the water at Fukushima Daiichi. The tsunami destroyed the cooling pumps. All that rubble along the coast are the cooling pumps that were designed to cool that chain reaction after the shutdown. Didn't happen. We call that a, a, a Lewis, loss of the ultimate heat sink. Well, it didn't just happen at Fukushima Daiichi. There were 14 nuclear plants that had their cooling pumps knocked out. This picture shows, in the north there's Anagawa, that had three nukes. Then came Fukushima Daiichi with six nukes. Then came Fukushima Daini, with four nukes, and then just to the south of that was Chokai with one nuke. And all of them lost their pumps. And here's, why, here's where luck came in. Technology failed. There's no doubt technology failed. And here's where luck came in. If that accident, that, it, the, the, the accident happened on the day shift on a Friday. There was 1,000 people at Daiichi. There was 1,000 people at Daini, Anagawa, and Tokai. If the, if the earthquake and tsunami had happened in the, in the evening, there would have been 100 people there. And it was courageous people that stopped the meltdown from being even worse than what it was. So a 12-hour difference in the timing of that tsunami would have resulted in the contamination, the destruction of Japan, and the contamination of the whole northern hemisphere. So the second, the, the third point then, the first point was accidents are going to happen frequently. Second is they're getting worse. And they could have been much worse, is my third point. Fukushima was a technological breakdown. Nothing worked. And it was through luck and the courage of perhaps several thousand people that this accident didn't result in the destruction of Japan. I've gotten to know um, Naoto Khan, who was the Prime Minister of Japan when the, uh, when the accident happened. The, um, uh, and, and he said, I, I think he says it best in one sentence, he said, our existence as a sovereign nation was at stake. Now he's not the only one who had to face down a nuclear accident. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev in his memoir says that the, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union was not due to perestroika. It was due to Chernobyl. So we've got two examples 
with a, with a democratically elected and a communist dictator who both believe that nuclear power can fundamentally destroy a, a, a culture overnight. We know this is too big to fail. The Spanish Armada was too big to fail. We all know that. The Titanic was too big to fail. We all know that. And Wall Street was too big to fail. We all know that. Well, we also think that nuclear is too big to fail. And I think in our hubris, um, that's a lesson we really should take from Fukushima. This is not a technology that's too big to fail. I have a way of saying it. I say that sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. So to sum up, we've got accidents that are going to happen once a decade. They're going to be incredibly severe and the radiation doesn't stop at the border. We know that from Three Mile Island sort of stayed in, in, inside um, uh, Pennsylvania. But then Chernobyl contaminated all of Europe and Fukushima is contaminating the entire Pacific. So the question is to us, we have an opportunity now. This is not, in my way of thinking, a sustainable solution. This is not a holistic solution. And I really think that's why perhaps I'm here today, you know, called to talk about maybe sustainability and a holistic solution. This is not that way. And we can implement from the bottom up a policy that convinces our policymakers to, to change course before it's too late. Thank you very much.